Hey everybody, welcome back. Everybody uh, seeing the screen and hearing my voice? Everything cool? Yeah, we see you. All right. Uh, not a lot of folks here. Maybe more people will drop in. So uh, this is the week that we've been leading up to. This is production week where you guys are going to actually make your production, uh, make your presentation. So uh, we've tried to strip the other activities down to a minimum. Uh, we still have some reading. We have some, a little bit of reading from both books, some from Cytology and some from Re Resonation, Resonate. Uh, but they, they deal with topics that are, you know, on hand for you. Um, creating content, uh, figuring out how to structure the story. This is one of the things we're dealing with. I was able to get through most of your plans. I think everybody's doing really well. I was very pleased uh, that everybody seems to be on track. Uh, this is one of those months where everybody seems to be pretty sharp and is, is getting the instructions and knows what we're looking for. So we want you to make a complete presentation this week. This isn't a rough draft. This is a first draft. So we're going to go soup to nuts this week. That's why we had you doing last week, figuring out all the content and planning. So hopefully now that you know exactly, you know, what's going into the presentation, you can just deal with the nuts and bolts of putting it together. And uh, I want everybody to start with the voiceover. Uh, if this is not the way you normally work in PowerPoint or work in presentations, please try it this way because I think it's going to have an impact on the kind of production that you make. If you start with what you have to say and then you hold off on the slides until the slides can comment on your narrative, then I think you're going to have a stronger presentation. And if you concentrate on the narrative, the narrative becomes cleaner, shorter, sharper. Uh, and uh, the one thing I don't want people doing is something that happens an awful lot with PowerPoint, which is you create a bunch of slides and then you talk to each slide as if each slide has its own narration uh, and they don't necessarily connect. I don't want that at all. I want a single voiceover that's three to four minutes long from you guys to figure it out. And uh, uh, to that extent, we have some reading on how to structure your story that's uh, in uh, Slideology. I think that's, that's gonna be helpful. And a, a lot of the content is stuff that we've already figured out. Make sure you're focusing in on the audience. I made sure that all of you have a particular company that you're talking to. And as you do this address, you're not talking to your classmates, you're not talking to me, you're talking directly to those folks that have the ability to hire you. And so I want you to be able to, to think about them, to visualize them as you're talking. And if you've chosen a big faceless corporation, if you, if you decided that you want to get hired by Google and, and it's run by these two genius guys, you know, who you'll never see even if you get hired by Google, uh, don't imagine that you're talking to them. Imagine that you're talking to the person at Google who really does hiring and recruiting and, and read up on that process. So it's, it's actually a pretty fun thing. They run a sort of little mini camp and they, they may have you do uh, uh, exercises and puzzles and, and different things to figure out what kind of person you are. And so imagine what that hiring process is and imagine the people you'll actually be talking to and then think about how you're gonna persuade them that you're the right person for uh, what you wanna do. And so all of this is to get you in the right frame of mind. And so the very first thing that you need to do is convert all the elements of your plan into a story to figure out how to tell that story and come up with the language for it and then uh, commit it to, to, to audio, to voice it out. And uh, we, you know, we want you to go through that structure. We want you to do this we want you to tell a compelling story about who you are and what your skills are and why you deserve to work with this company. And it's only by telling stories that you're really going to reach through to people. That's one of the things we're trying to impress upon you, that we don't want you just to list off a bunch of facts. We want you to figure out how those facts fit together, put them into a story, and tell it with cohesion and drama. And I know that's difficult. That's going to be the most important thing that you figure out this week is how do you tell your story? Okay, you know how to tell a story. You know what the facts and figures of your life are. 
but how do you do that? And uh, oftentimes we talk about ourselves in common language and you're not going to be able to get away from this. A lot of times as you talk in your resume and, and, and you try to sell yourself, you end up saying the same thing as other people say. I'm a go-getter. I do out of the box thinking, et cetera. So there are going to be times where you're almost limited by your language. You're going to say things that in saying them, you need to say it, but uh, you will not have really like rung the bell. And that's why it's the combination of images and text or in audio that, that, that can break through. So I actually have an exercise that I think is really useful for you guys to go on. Uh, we're gonna get started with it right now. And, and those of you that are watching this on video, uh, that's gonna be linked to in the discussion board. This week's discussion board is not a graded activity. We've taken that away so that you have less to think about and worry about, and you can spend the entire week working on creating your production, uh, your presentation. Uh, but what, we're, what we put into the discussion board alternatively is a bunch of tips and I've, I've, I've posted some videos that I think are helpful. I'll talk about those in a second. But we want you guys to just converse with each other. You can put up parts of your work as, you're, as you want to get uh, feedback on it from your classmates. If you write part of a script and you want to put that up, if you get your initial recording up and you want to, want to have critique that before you go forward, you can use the, the, um, this week's discussion board as a sounding board for that. And this week's discussion board is actually going to be open for two weeks. It's open next week. So the very same discussion board, 3.3, is going to be open uh, from now to the end of the month. And we want you to use this to get feedback from your classmates. And so at the end of the week, when you post your finished discussion, your presentation for me for a grade, we also want you to end up putting it in the discussion board so your classmates can see to it. And you can all give each other practice giving each other feedback. This is a voluntary activity. I can't make people do it, but if you participate in it, then your other people will will, will reciprocate and help you. And I think it's a, a valuable extra information. And I'll talk more about that next week after you've finished your presentation. But for this week, just know that you don't have to post. The discussion board is not for a grade, but it's helpful information in there. So if you have a program that you find, if you find a a program for recording audio or you find a presentation tool that you like that you want to share with your classmates that's the place to like pass off useful information and such and this exercise that i'm taking you to uh to help us figure out how to how to use visuals to make our language come alive i'll call it visualize ideas uh, i've linked to in the discussion board as well so everybody who's watching on video can participate in this exercise we're going to do right now so I've made a Google page um, and I'm going to uh, uh, put it, drop it in the, in the uh, chat box right now. So if everybody in, uh, watching clicks on this link that I just put in the chat box, you're going to be transported to this single page. Now this is a Google doc that I've created. It's a collaborative doc. Everyone who comes to this page gets full editing permissions. So it's a slightly dangerous thing. Every single one of you could select all and delete and wipe out the entire page. So we now have to practice a little bit of safety so that we're working together with each other. Every one of you, when you come in, you have a different color assigned to you. See all those little icons in the upper corner here? Each one of you is a different person and each one of you has a slightly different color. The color that's assigned to you is the color of your cursor. And we want you to put your cursor in the right place so that you're not, um, you're not working against a classmate. And what I've done here, the, the notion of this exercise is I put in the kind of words, the kind of language that becomes the kind of boilerplate that we talk about each other. You say, I'm a team player, I, you know, I'm a problem solver. And that we've heard it so many times. If you just hear the words, it maybe doesn't make a whole lot of impact. So what I'm challenging you guys to do is to take some of these words and find images that tell that story in a dynamic and exciting way and tell it your way that makes it uh, interesting and exciting. So the challenge here is to find a visual to explain or comment or color a word that 
is essentially you. It's, it's not just enough to solve the problem. I want you to solve the problem so that it, it shows how creative and smart you are. And I want you to solve a problem so that it shows you know who you're talking to. You know, if you find a cheap image that everybody can laugh at, at like low level Facebook meme, yeah, maybe you've solved it, but you haven't necessarily uh, made it personal. You haven't necessarily aimed it right at that audience that can hire, you know, of, of, of employers that can hire you. So my challenge to you is to find just the right image that speaks to who you are and speaks to who you're talking to. And it makes it personal and creative. So what I want you to do is, is uh, claim one of these boxes. I've created several boxes here and, and they're all in rows. So when you choose one of these words, you don't have to do them all. I mean, you don't have to do any of them. This is voluntary. But uh, you can do one word or all of them. But uh, when you choose a term, then I want you to go do a Google image search and find just the right image that you would put with that term to really sell it, to really reach your target audience. So if your target audience is a gamer, you might look for gamer imagery. If your target audience is a movie producer, maybe you're going to look for a movie clip that, that, that turn things it. So you, you have to think about who's your audience and who you are and what you want to say and how you want to convince them. I want to show you how this works. So I've created several boxes here and for every big box, there's a small box and it has the word name on it. So before you actually start doing anything, I want you to claim a box. This is how we're all going to keep from stepping on top of each other. So I did the first one here. I, I did the first one that took the word adventurous and I have this classic, you know, 19th century painting of a guy standing on the edge of a mountaintop, staring into the, the world beyond. And to me, that speaks adventure and it speaks it with a, a style that I consider my style. Might be old and corny for you, but it's, 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 it's the way that I would say this. So um, I chose this image and I want it to say, this is I'm adventurous. So I'm gonna do a second one here, here and I've, I've staked out the word team player. And I've staked it out by putting my name under it. So each of you that want to participate, go ahead and grab a box and put your name under it. So if nobody's name is under it, you can go ahead and put your name there. And you're saying, I'm claiming the box above and I'm going to put my image there. So first thing you want to do is just stake out a box for yourself. And once you've staked out the box, put your cursor in the box above. Make sure you see your blinking cursor. That's where the image is going to end up getting pasted. Now, once you have your cursor there, you want to go up to the top menu to insert. And remember, this is a page that was written by Google. So they built into this page Google search. I want you to go to insert image, search the web. And when you do that, you're going to see that part of the page actually opens up and becomes a Google search right into the page. It's very useful. So I think most of you are going to be tempted to just take that term and, and type it in uh, to the search engine and, and see that. Now, whenever you search Google, you don't just get a, a result. You don't just get 10 results. You get 300,000 results. You get 4 million results. You get 100 million results. So I don't want you to be that guy that's always taking the very first choice on a Google search. That's a lazy person. I want you to really look through here and find the thing that works for you. Now, as I put in the term team player, I'm seeing an awful lot of soccer. Soccer is the most important, you know, the most um, loved sport in the world. So I'm sure that it manages that sport. It manages, you know, the, the Google rankings or whatever. But soccer doesn't speak to me. So you can manipulate this. You don't necessarily have to put the word in. You could just use this as any kind of search thing. And when I think about team player, I have a particular image in mind. So instead of type, instead of searching on the actual word, I'm going to put in skydive formation. And now I have a lot of images of people skydiving and falling through the air and forming a group. And to me, that says team player. And so I just need to go through and find the image that is dramatic and compelling and says this the way that I want to say it. And I'm going to choose this one right here. And when I choose it, it gets a blue check mark on it. And I have a little uh, button down at the bottom for insert. So once I've selected that image, I can hit insert. 
and it goes in right where my cursor puts it. And there I've chosen an image that says team player for me. And so that's me trying to visualize the idea of team player. So I'm gonna let you guys play with this. I'm gonna keep going on with my lecture, but uh, those of you that are logged in, uh, you wanna participate, you don't have to, it's voluntary, but it's, it's a useful exercise that'll make you better and get you in shape for making your own presentations. So just, uh, just think about these words and how you can make them have drama and come alive and how you can pick an image that will then, you know, revivify the language itself. So uh, pick a spot, do some searching, find, the, find the, uh, the image you want. And the image should speak to who you are and it should speak to who your target audience is. You know, you would choose different images for different target audiences. So uh, again, um, those are the things to be thinking about as you do this. And uh, again, those of you that are uh, watching this on video, know that in the discussion board, I have placed a number of things already. I'll talk about some of the, uh, the articles and tips, but I've also got a couple of movies here that I want you to watch. And then the right here is visualizing ideas. If you click on this link in the discussion board, you can participate in this well. It'll be available all week and we can continue that conversation that way. But if I um, come back here to where I left off, you guys can keep working on visualizing ideas. Um, part of the reading that you're going to be having this week and that is very important is about how to structure your content so that you're telling the story the way you want. You know, there's a, a zillion ways to tell a story. You know, the, those of you that are, are working on the, uh, the piece last week in, in the discussion board, it, it turned out really great. You, you know that there's many different ways to tell a story. And as you're thinking about talking about yourself for this particular, for this week's project, you know, there are a number of ways to talk about yourself. Now, most of you are probably going to choose the chronological effort. You'll just start off with when you were young and you'll work your way through in time and et cetera. Uh, remember you're projecting into the future. So you're going to have to go beyond graduation, you know, to get the timing right. But most of you will start off with, you know, I, I first might play the Nintendo game when I was five or, you know, I heard my, you know, um, uh, I saw my first Disney movie, you know, when I was three years old. And you're just going to sort of take us through your life and you'll hit the milestones. The whole thing about storytelling is you don't want to give all the detail. You want to give spotted detail. You want to give us flavor of your life, but certain things you'll abstract. So figuring out what you give attention to and what you sort of abstract over is the important thing that you'll learn in storytelling. And uh, there, are, uh, you know, that's one way to do it is to tell it chronologically. There are a couple of other ways to do it. And for most of you, the thing you're going to be stuck with is not knowing how to tell your story is that when I say that you're introducing yourself and your skills, most of you pretty much think that you're taking your resume and you're putting it into PowerPoint. And to some extent that's true. But if you simply take your resume and put it into PowerPoint, you're making that boring PowerPoint that we talked about in week one, which is just a list of facts. Your resume is necessarily a lot of data that matters. I went to school here, I was born here, I worked here, then I worked here, then I worked here. I have this degree. Uh, all of that's important information, but it's all scattered information. Uh, and if you just simply tell it as data, it becomes a boring PowerPoint. But all the information that's there is exactly what you wanna tell in a story. So how can you take that resume and instead of making it isolated facts, make a story out of it? Well, uh, the first video I want you guys to watch is a TED talk from Simon Sinek. It's called Start With Why. And he gives us the answer to that. Because if you look at your resume, it's a complete listing of what you have done. I did this, I joined the army, I got this degree, then I studied here, then I worked here. You know, it's what you did. It's a fact. But if you turn that on its side and you start with why, instead of telling us what you did, 
tell us why you did each one of those things. What was the intrinsic motivation that led you to join the army or to get involved in music or to, 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 to realize that math led you into understanding coding and that you wanted to be a, a programmer for the rest of your life? What was the motivation that led you to do the thing that's on your resume? If you start with why, that's incredibly interesting. That's a story. So you can take your resume and turn it into your uh, voiceover content by simply attacking each one of those points. And instead of just telling us what you did, tell us why you did it. Tell us what was the motivation, what was the, what was the uh, inner yearning, the, the desire, the goal, uh, the, the passion that created that. And that becomes a really interesting story. So I, I hope most of you will watch that Simon Sinek story. It's not the way everybody has to tell a story, but for some of you, it'll be a problem solved. The other one is a little more complicated. It's a little more uh, wacky. It's called How to Structure a Video Essay. It's by Tony Zhou. And he basically looks at a, um, uh, an Orson Welles documentary called F for Fake. It's a feature film. And it has more than one subject, has more than two subjects, has more than three subjects. There are actually six different elements that go through this film. And instead of telling six different uh, stories, you know, one than the other, he starts each one of them and then moves on to tell a part of another story. And then at a certain point, he has all these stories opened up and he just jumps back and forth and tells a little bit of each one in parallel. Now this is actually a story structure that we're kind of familiar with. If you've ever watched one of those big sprawling dramas like Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones has like a hundred characters and a uh, hundred locations. And, and at the beginning there's, you know, the woman uh, with the dragons in the desert and there's the, 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 the guy uh, with his sword in the winter wall and there's the intrigue in the palace. So you have all these locations, all these different people, all these different dramas, and it just jumps back and forth, telling a little part of each. But as the story progresses in parallel, they all come together. And that's the way to tell a story. And for some of you, if your life is a little more complicated, you haven't even quite figured out why you did all the things you did in your life, but you know that it's important to tell your whole story. You know, you had this whole stint in the army or you had this other career before you switched careers. Um, then maybe you want to tell your story in parallel because that's a more interesting way of getting a sense of who you are. Because maybe the, who you are today is the synthesis of several paths rather than a single path that led inexorably to who you are. And that's for you to decide. But it's also uh, a a strategy for telling stories. And it's not gonna work for everybody. It's not gonna work every time, but occasionally it does work. And the interesting thing is everybody can understand how to do this because Tony Zhou relates, relates it to a uh, TV show that you all are familiar with, South Park. Those little runts that run around in, in Colorado. And every epi single episode of South Park is 22 minutes long. It has three different storylines that run through the entire thing, and then they all, all three of those come together at the end. You may not realize that now, but when you watch the, uh, the essay, you think about South Park, you're going to realize that's, that's the, the, the strategy that they use, and it works every time. So it's, it's uh, interesting enough that they can just keep using it, and most people don't, don't even necessarily know that that's going on. So uh, these are interesting possibilities. Again, there's no one way... There's no uh, absolute way to tell a story. So you're gonna have to figure this out. And part of it is by trial and error, but uh, basically choose the best solution or the most logical for you right now and, and give it a try. But write that story, put it together. I highly recommend writing it as a script. You don't have to write a script. Nobody needs to turn in the script to me, but in order for you to voice it out, it's a good way to control the structure. We're asking you to make a piece that's three to four minutes long. And a lot of times when people think they are in control of what they have to say, 
what you turn on the mic and you just start talking, if you don't have any control vectors, all of a sudden you start talking for eight minutes, nine minutes. I've had people turn in presentations that were 18 or 20 minutes long because people just couldn't stop talking and they didn't really have any control that they'd set on themselves. But a great way of controlling that is by writing it down because we already know that about one page of text, double spaced, if you voice it out, is about a minute speaking. So if you want a three to four minute presentation, you should write something that's three to four minutes long. And in general, you're controlling for time. Now this, uh, this designation of our assignment that I wanted to be three or four minutes, if you're a little short, if you're a little long, don't worry about that. We're, you know, we're, we're not sweating those details, but we do want you to shoot for a target. You know, if I give you a target of three to four minutes and you automatically give me something 20 minutes long, uh, you haven't planned correctly. So I want to make sure that you're actually uh, hitting this ballpark. And believe me, as presentations go, as life stories go, three to four minutes is about appropriate. It's enough time to get a sense of who you are it's not so much time that we get annoyed with every little detail of your life. So uh, that's where this is going to be the most powerful as a persuasion tool at three to four minutes. If you go a little over, it's okay. But uh, another thing that's gonna happen is that you're gonna get feedback from me this week after you turn in your project and we're gonna get a chance to make it better. So if you went a little bit over, maybe one of the feedbacks will, I'm gonna give you maybe Let's try to tighten it up and see if we can make it a little, a little uh, shorter next time. But right now, a good way to control the timing is to write it out ahead of time and put it on paper. And then, very, very important, once you've written it, you should say it aloud before you even try to record it. Because hearing, those, hearing yourself say those words is a kind of revelation. You, you can write and think it, you know what it's gonna sound like. But until you say it out loud, you aren't really clear. And sometimes you're gonna find certain phrases, certain things that you've written down that are hard for you to say. And maybe you wanna change a little bit of the language so it fits your mouth a little more naturally. Cause it should sound like you. It should sound like a natural part of your conversation. And if you end up saying things that aren't the way you normally speak, it sounds odd. So testing it out, saying it out loud will give you another chance to maybe edit that script a little bit and get more familiar with what's going on. Uh, another thing is we can always, always tell when someone is reading something for the very first time. It's in their vocal performance. There are these strange pauses in which people are reading something to figure it out what to say. And the easy way to get over that is to rehearse. Just say it out loud first and then the second time you do it you're going to do it better and the third time you're going to do it you're going to do it even better so if you play this back and it sounds like you're reading from a script try it again you're going to become more familiar with the script each time and therefore you'll sound more natural each time and uh, recording audio doesn't take any more than real time and you know uh, it's just another three minutes if you want to make another recording so uh, you know don't be stingy about re-recording if you if you think you can make a better audio performance. Uh, one of the bits of reading that you're going to come to uh, this week uh, is about how to approach an audience. Um, people have been standing in front of audiences for thousands of years and the ancient Greeks had it as a, a form of you know popular pastime. Uh, public speaking was was almost like um, uh, uh, an entertainment in ancient Greece. So uh, one of the uh, great philosophers, Aristotle, wrote a treatise called The Three Pillars of Public Speaking. They, and it talks about how an audience accepts the speaker or what your relationship to the audience is, depending on who you are and what you're bringing to the table. And it's still relevant today. It's called The Three Pillars of Public Speaking. And it's about whether or not the audience is going to accept or believe or trust you. And so the three pillars are ethos, it's the appeal to trust. People are gonna believe you because you're a credible speaker. 
And the ways that you become a credible speaker is that you have a lived experience, you have um, uh, credentials, you know, you're, you're a doctor of this or you wrote this book and that's why you're an expert. But you don't necessarily have to have, you know, a long resume to be credible. You can just have lived experience. But people will believe you because you are speaking from firsthand knowledge and you are a trustworthy person. That's the appeal to ethos. Now, if you don't necessarily know who you are and they don't necessarily apply that uh, uh, standard, another way that they'll uh, accept you is if you're emotional about it, if you're very involved and enthusiastic. And this is one way that young students who don't necessarily have a huge resume can appeal to veteran uh, you know, uh, uh, owners of companies because they've gone through that experience before and they can, you can end up reminding them of their younger selves. If your passion for the subject is so great that it outweighs maybe the, the gaps in your uh, experience, people will uh, still accept you. And the appeal to emotion runs the gamut. It includes all emotions. So there's a little bit more to say about it than that, but the appeal to emotion is a way to substitute for the appeal to ethos. And the third way is called logos. It's the appeal to logic. And therefore you're putting together an argument that you expect the audience to be skeptical of. And so everything you do is based on uh, buttressing that argument. If you tell us a fact, you're gonna tell, tell us where it came from. You're gonna use lots of footnotes. You're gonna use lots of charts and graphs and you're gonna, you're gonna tell us your sources so that everything you say, you can tell people where this information came from and that it's not just they, they have to trust you, but that you've already done the, the hard research, found the facts, and you're putting together a logical argument for what you wanna do. And so, uh, this usually applies to subjects in which you really want to convince someone of someone to join a cause or uh, uh, to be involved in, in uh, technical endeavors and so forth. Uh, and people are looking for the gaps in your logic and you want to argue in such a way that you're, you're, you're uh, putting up proofs against all those, those uh, uh, doubts. So there's a little more to say on each one. In ethos, people want to ask, does the audience respect you? Does the audience believe that you're a good character? Does the audience believe that you're generally trustworthy? Does the audience believe that you're an authority on this topic? And again, authority is a, uh, a word that we can define a little broadly here. Uh, you know, if you want to speak about cancer, uh, and you're a doctor and you've got, you know, a full alphabet soup behind your name, you, you're a doctor of this and you awarded this and you have these uh, titles, et cetera. People will believe you because of your resume, because, you know, you're, you're important, because you, you've proven, you know, in other fields that uh, uh, you're, you, you've gotten your authority. But people can also just believe it in, in, in lived experience. You know, if you wanna talk about cancer, and you're 12 years old, uh, you can say that you're an authority because my mother died and I lived through that. And that lived experience is what you've based your authority on. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be um, uh, super piled up in the resume regard. It just means that you have to give people uh, a reason, an avenue, a venue into what is your trustworthiness? What is the basis for the relationship? And sometimes it's just personal. Sometimes people have a personality that you just uh, feel like you can trust. You know, that's, you're a Tom Hanks type of person or, you know, the, the kind of person that everybody seems to kind of trust. In pathos, do your words evoke feelings of love, sympathy, fear? So the interesting thing about this is that uh, while we think about pathos, we normally think about happy emotions. We show pictures of puppies and, you know, people giggling and so forth. You can go the other way and use uh, negative emotions as well. Now, this is a very uh, um, dangerous thing to do and you need to be a little more 
uh, accomplished at, at, at doing it before you go into these areas? Do your feelings, do your visuals evoke feelings of envy or compassion? Uh, does your characterization of the competition evoke feelings of contempt or hatred? So this gets into what we call negative advertising. And this being political season, um, political ads are full of what we call negative advertising in which the politician doesn't stand up and say, love me, I'm terrific. He says, hate the other guy, vote against him. And so we are using uh, pathos as a way to instoke and instill negative feelings against the competition. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with what you guys are dealing with at all, because you do not compete against anybody. The mission that I've given you in which you have three to four minutes to talk to your dream audience, I don't even want you to think about other people that might be wanting to talk to them, same people. I know that you're one of a thousand or a hundred thousand people that want to work for Disney. But in this particular instance, you're the only one that has their attention. So I don't want you to undercut yourself by saying, oh, I know there are thousands of people you could pick. Don't even introduce those thoughts. Don't bring in negative thoughts into this because you, this is three or four minutes that you control. And other people don't exist. You're only talking about yourself. You don't have to compare yourself to the competition or anything. You just have to make yourself a compelling uh, figure in their eyes. And the way that you do that is you don't compare yourself to other people. You just talk about your own distinct advantages. So in pathos, we end up doing a lot of uh, what happens in, in television advertising, competition, comparison, and so forth. We don't want to do that here. You want, if you want to use pathos as your relationship to the audience, just evoke feelings of um, your enthusiasm, your joy at their product. Maybe you're, you're going with this game company because you love the games they make. Make sure you know, make sure they know how much you respect and admire them. Those are going to be feelings of, of, of uh, respect and pathos that will work to your advantage. And finally, in Logos, does your message make sense? Is your message based on facts, statistics, evidence? Will your call to action lead to the outcome that you're promised? So a Logos-based argument is almost like the summation of a legal trial in which you state all the facts, you say where the evidence came from, you conclude everything, and your takeaway at the end of the presentation should be exactly what you're asking the audience to do. Therefore, you should hire me. Therefore, you should join my cause. Therefore, you should buy this product. Therefore, you should uh, you know, um, think this way about this issue. If you've convinced them with a logos-based argument, then your, your takeaway line has to be exactly what you're trying to convince them to do. And uh, usually that works. Um, in, in the kind of presentations we're talking about for this class, uh, logo space arguments work pretty good for programmers. You talk about the languages that you've learned. You talk about the projects you've been on. You talk about how familiar you are with their product. And you're really making a compelling case that, they're, that you are exactly the employee that they're looking for. So each one of those has its own choices and outcomes. And it has to do with your relationship to the audience. So it's just something to think about. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes you have an ethos space argument, but it also has some compathos and there's some little overlap there. Uh, it's very rare that you have all three arguments at the same point, but if you do, then you've absolutely won. But uh, you can combine ethos and logos, you can combine logos and pathos. A lot, there's a lot of overlap that happens between two of these, but it rarely happens between all three. And uh, certainly there are times where it's just the individual uh, message by itself. So uh, that is uh, the reading. There's not a whole lot of reading that you need to do. Uh, let's get back to uh, seeing how folks did with uh, uh, the project here. Uh, Asia has uh, really uh, 
lush jungle here for adventurous. Uh, and Annika has a kind of uh, uh, work project going on for dependable. So it's like people working together, I can get that. Uh, the image itself needs to probably be a little stronger, but I guess if it scales up, it's gonna look pretty good. Uh, Braden's got a very graphic image here and uh, definitely says problem solver. Uh, we have a, a controller come, uh, going straight to the brain. So very nice graphic design, graphic image. This is the kind of thing that reads very fast in a slide. So if it's even if it's up for just two or three seconds, people are going to get it. Uh, again, Ela has a great image for uh, uh, um, uh, adventurous, somebody who's looking into a, a 3D set. So I see lots of great stuff here. Uh, yeah, you guys kind of get it. So all of these are compelling images that will work and in conjunction with what you say, I think we'll keep going. So uh, anybody that wants to, uh, you know, keep at that, uh, the link is just right here. Uh, in addition, I put a few other links here for interesting things. Um, you guys have your own choice of what you want to put uh, your presentations together with. We've talked about PowerPoint. You all have been given the latest version of PowerPoint, but there is by no means a, um, a compulsion, a, a, a need to use PowerPoint if you don't want. For some of you, PowerPoint is just a little too complicated. There's an awful lot of options. And to that end, there's something I have to show you about PowerPoint because there's so much in there that, it, that there's something important that's hidden to you guys. And I have to, to show you that and I'll get to that in a second. But um, if you're not familiar with PowerPoint, uh, it's not a great tool to start with just because there's so many options. So uh, there are other things that you can use that work well. Uh, Google Slides is very much like PowerPoint, but it has much fewer options. So if you wanna get started and you eventually wanna use PowerPoint, Google Slides might be a good alternative because it's an easier way to start. It has fewer options and yet uh, it makes it much simpler to keep going. Uh, Adobe Spark, which we mentioned to you last week, any of you that used Adobe Spark last week and had a good experience, uh, I highly recommend using that for the discussion or for this week's uh, presentation. You will find that it is very, very capable. You can record your voice. You can add slides. Uh, Adobe uh, has a number of great images that you can do searching uh, uh, that's built into their search tools. You can add video. So uh, there are a number of options that Adobe Spark adds to the uh, mix and it exports as an MPEG-4 video and therefore it's pretty easy to load up to our system or load up to YouTube or pass around uh, and being able to get your information back out of a uh, presentation tool is very important. I have a link here to an article that runs you through several online presentation tools and you're, you're free to use any and all of them that you like. Uh, some of you have used some of these before, picks, um, uh, Prezi. Now Prezi is, is, is okay, but it really isn't great for this particular project. You know, it, the way it zooms in and out is interesting, uh, but it's very much text-based. You have to have audio and, and, and Prezi doesn't record the audio. You'd have to record the audio on your own. Now you can make a Prezi in which you record your audio and you, you, you sync it online. And uh, that's what we're asking for if you do use Prezi. But uh, again, uh, there are better tools for what we're looking for here. So there's a number of different tools here. Um, Emaze is a really interesting tool. Uh, again, you have to add your own audio to that. So a lot of these online tools don't include the audio feature. So uh, the audio that we, the audio tool that we recommended to you last week, Audacity, is a really good thing if you're going to record your own audio and use one of these online presentation tools. Uh, there's a lot of great advantages here. Uh, one of the online tools that I want to warn you against is Powtoons. If you've never heard of Powtoons, forget I ever said anything. If you like Powtoons, know that they have in the last year or so become a bait and switch kind of organization where it's easy to join, it's easy to create something, but if you want to bring your file out, they're going to make you pay them money and upsell. So please don't use Powtoons because they're going to 
try to hit you for a fee and we don't want you paying them anything. So uh, I know that Paltoons provides a lot of uh, fun pre-made uh, animation art. Uh, and uh, I like Paltoons as well, but I am very much against their new model of trying to trick people in, you know, claiming that they're free and then actually making you pay money to actually use their files for anything. So um, just stay away from Paltoons. They're, uh, they're a racket nowadays. So there are a lot of different possibilities. You can go through the article. I have some linked here. Uh, if you have an older Android phone, you're going to find that an awful lot of the media tools we recommend don't run on those. Uh, and the one that does is called VoiceThread. So if, you, if your only device is an older Android phone, uh, I recommend trying VoiceThread. That it does allow you to record your audio and it does allow you to add slides. It's not super sophisticated, but it works and it'll allow you to do the project. Um, so uh, those are the options. My, my number one option, I think, is going to be Adobe Spark. I think you'll find that works pretty well. Uh, those of you that haven't used Audacity yet uh, know that it's, it's pretty powerful and uh, it allows you uh, to do your audio in a, in a pretty interesting way, meaning that um, most of you that don't have any editing, uh, audio editing tools will have to get a perfect recording. So you just will have your three or four minute speech and if you mess up, then you hit the delete button and you start over again. And it is possible with a couple of tries to, to get all the way through without any problems. However, if you have a tool like this uh, and you just hit record and you start recording everything, the interesting thing is you have this visual uh, pack here. And if you want to get rid of something, if you make a mistake, the easiest thing to do, instead of starting over, if you mess up a line, just go silent for a few seconds and then start talking again. You will have created a blank space that you can come back and easily find. And therefore, if you want to get rid of a mistake, you can just come back to where you made that mistake, select it, hit the delete key, and make an edit. It's a very easy, it's very visual, it's very simple editing. And therefore, you could do the entire recording all at once even if you made a couple of mistakes, you just go back and you clean up those mistakes. And Audacity allow, also allows you to export as an MPEG-3 file or uh, any other kind of audio that you need. So um, I, I highly recommend Audacity if you're not using uh, a tool that, also, that already includes the audio. Now, Adobe Spark includes the audio and PowerPoint includes the audio. So you don't need to use uh, a third-party tool if you're doing that. If you're using your phone, uh, the articles that I've linked here, I have uh, tips on using the iOS app Voice Memo. That's built into every iPhone and every iPad, and that will allow you to record audio and then export it. So you can make your audio recordings on that. And then I also have a link to Android audio apps um, that you can get from the Google Play Store. So. Uh, Depending on whether you're using your phone or you're using your computer, we have some articles for you and tips and tips about using audio. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about recording audio. Again, we want you to use your room voice so we don't want you speaking too quietly. Uh, and, and if you speak loud, just make sure the microphone is far enough away that it's not being over modulated. But if the microphone is too far away, you're going to get a very soft recording. You don't want that either. So you know, figuring out where to place the microphone, 90% of getting a good recording. So uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, I, uh, I, I, I said there was an issue with PowerPoint. Uh, here we have latest PowerPoint. I'm going to quickly create some slides. So uh, here's a title slide. And uh, I'm going to add second slide and I'm going to call that slide two and I'm going to add another slide and maybe I'll call that slide three. Add one more slide and uh, oh why don't I call that slide four. 
So if you're going to record audio and PowerPoint, uh, oftentimes it's not clear how to do it. And a lot of times people just record audio per slide. And that is terrible. That, that leads to bad habits. And it means that you're stuck in a particular orientation of slides. The correct way to do audio for PowerPoint is to be on slide one and to put your audio, all of your audio on slide one. So you can record the audio elsewhere. And if you do, you can go to insert audio, audio from file or audio browser or whatever, and you can import an external piece of audio. But for most of you, you'll actually use the built-in tool. So it was right next to it. If I'm on slide one, I can come to insert audio, record audio, and I get a record tool. Now, it's not nearly as sophisticated as the Audacity interface. So all I'm gonna do is start and stop the recording. But I wanna do that, I'm gonna start recording now, and I'm recording right now, and if I were speaking right now, I'd speak for three or four minutes, all the way through, get my recording clean, and when I was done, I'd stop it, hit insert, and then my audio would become on the page as an icon as a slide one. Now, there are hidden menus in PowerPoint that you need to have access to, and you will never even know they're there unless you create audio. Because until you actually create audio and select it, they don't show up. But if you look up here at my menu bar, once I select a piece of audio, I have two new menus that sh suddenly appear contextually. Microsoft, Microsoft thinks they're doing us a favor by hiding this, but they never even told us it was there, so that's an issue. And that's why I have to tell you so that you know that it's here. But you wanna come to the playback menu and you wanna choose that the audio plays automatically. So as someone goes into playback mode, the audio, you don't, in it, you don't want it, the audience to click to initiate it, you want it to play just on its own. So play automatically. And then very important, play across slides. Unless you have this button clicked, the audio on slide one will never go past slide one. But when you do, suddenly that audio is available to all the slides. <coughs> this is a hugely important thing to check. And Power, uh, PowerPoint, does, uh, Microsoft didn't really bother to tell you that it was there. But you need to do this in order to make the kind of presentation that I want you to make. If this is a three to four minute recording and it's on slide one and you get clicked, play across slides, you're now set up to en enable your entire recording to work out the way you want it. So there's one more step to do here. We have all our audio on slide one and we have, let's assume these are all of our slides. The way I'm gonna make the audio uh, sync up to my slides is to run slideshow record slideshow. So that's a function that's built into the desktop tools. It's not necessarily going to be available on the, uh, the, the, the iOS or Android versions because they don't include audio, but the Windows and Mac versions of PowerPoint, you can record the slideshow and suddenly it's going to go into playback mode recording now and I'm recording and it's right playing now. the audio that and recorded speaking right now I'd speak and it's playing slide one all the way through when I click it's going to go to slide two done. I'm making a choice stop based on the audio and I'm clicking forward and when I finish it's going to ask do I want to save it and I say yes and then suddenly the timings are set here whenever I clicked to go from slide one to slide two the system remembered it and it can play it back in exact sync. And if I got that sync wrong, all I need to do is come back and run record slideshow again and I'll make a new version. So you can, you can record, redo this until you get it right. Uh, but this gives you an awful lot of power because now you can get as many slides as you like. You can try out different slides and you can move their order around. And if you get everything synced up and then you add a slide or you change the order of slides, you know, it's pretty easy just to move slides around and make sure you've got the effect that you want. Uh, but then you need to come back and rerun record slideshow and that resets the sync. And once you've done that, you have a PowerPoint file, a PPTX file that you can turn in and that's the, 
the file that you can turn in on Sunday for the homework. So if you want to use PowerPoint, just remember how to use the hidden functions for audio and uh, everything will work out fine. So uh, that's what I wanted to make sure everybody knew about. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, Ronald, I've used, I used to use it for my sound mixes after vocals on GarageBand. Uh, so I think uh, Ronald is talking about Audacity. He has a little experience with it. So some of you may have experience with these. Some of you may have experience with more advanced sound tools. Uh, certainly Audacity is not the most sophisticated but it's actually the easiest to learn. So those of you who are not big audio people, uh, you'll find that, that Audacity is your friend because it's, it's friendly enough. Um, it, high end audio people like it as well because it's very capable. Uh, it, it, programs don't have to be overbearing and you know, overloaded to be useful. Uh, you, usually the simplest tool is the best. Uh, and uh, when something has too many options, uh, um, PowerPoint, <clears throat> uh, it becomes a problem just even remembering where they all are. So uh, the best tool you can use is the one you know how to use and that is simple and gets things, gets the job done. But uh, again, do you have any questions? I know I went through a lot of stuff here, but you guys are just going to be available to be working on this all week. If you have any questions, I'm going to be around. Uh, anybody that needs you know, more intensive help, it's very easy for me to give you a call and talk you through something on the phone. If you have like a specific question, certainly text it in. But sometimes when you get into production or how to do a certain function or, or how to run a certain program, it might be easier to talk about it on the phone. And, and certainly I'm available all week for you guys to call me and set up a time when you can be on your computer and I can talk to you on the phone and, and we can get this to work out. But uh, you have all week to get this done. Again, I want you to, to start with the audio. And once you've got the audio, adding slides to it and choosing the right slide program to, to put them in uh, should be um, uh, an, an, an easier choice. And uh, you know, assembling it all together uh, is not a tough thing uh, if you've started off in the right mode and, and got your audio in place. And uh, if you don't do the audio, you know, turn in what you can turn in. You know, if you turn in a script, if you turn in uh, a deck without audio, you know, you're going to lose points. Uh, but turn in something. And uh, again, we have next week to get it right. So if you can't get your audio done this week, you're going to have to get it done next week. But, um, you know, that risks your grade because the assignment is to have a presentation that's three to four minutes long with voiceover audio in place. And I'm expecting that from everybody. So uh, if, you're, if you're having an issue, if you're having a problem, get a hold of me. I want to work through those problems. I want to solve your problems so that you don't tell me I couldn't do it. There's no reason any of you can't do this. This is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking for your ideas and I don't want the technology to trip you up. Isla. If we are using drawings from other people as reference, would it be wise to credit them at the end of the presentation? Yes. Uh, anytime you're not using your own work, I want you to credit the image. But because you're projecting into the future, you, you guys all have the right to take artwork off the internet and say, this is something I created in you know, my last year at school, or this is a portfolio piece I made, etc. But having done that, having made that claim in the presentation, you do want to credit the source. And the, um, sometimes people run audio sources per slide. I find that to be a little um, uh, blocky, is too much information. It's often easier just to have one references credit page at the end. And we also allow you to have a separate credits page. So if you don't even want to put it on the slides, you could turn in a side document with your credits. So we do want you to credit your sources uh, and you have the ability to credit them per slide, which I don't recommend. The ability to credit them all together as reference slides at the end, which works well for a lot of people. Um, and you have the ability to turn it in as a separate little text document an auxiliary you know, a supplement to your presentation and uh, that keeps it out of the presentation, but make sure 
that you've satisfied the, uh, um, the goal of crediting the sources. Um, again, this being month one, we're not really getting heavy into citations. Uh, the school su subscribes to ALA citation format, but all we really want you to do is just say where the source came from. I got this image from a Google search. I got this image off of TED Talks. I got this image off of, uh, you know, uh, Adobe or something like that. So just saying where, saying where it came from, the, uh, the source website or the, the source company is, is, is uh, accreditation enough. And if there's an individual that you took it from, you know, if you're using so-and-so's artwork, mention them by name. What we want is to credit people who deserve credit. Uh, all right, any more questions? You can uh, unmute yourself and ask questions out loud or you can just type them in the chat box. Um, if I don't have any more questions, I'm gonna let you guys go. There's no need to keep you here, but uh, have a great week. I want you to be really creative. This is the week that you should be having fun. This is why you came to Full Sail, to, to be creative. So I want everybody to be as creative as you can be. Thanks everybody, good night.